Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. My name is Rod Hembry. I'm Janice. This is Quick Study Television, taking you from Genesis to Revelation in one year. We are having a great time. And one of the people who's here to help us study is Corey. Corey, what's up? Today we are going to be discussing officially discovering King Hezekiah. Excellent. And what did you study for today? Uh, Sennacherib is threatening Hezekiah once again. And then, of course, Ryan is here. Ryan, what is going on? Well, today in Cosmic Mysteries, we're exploring the red planet Mars, and great effort has been put into finding life there. So we're going to look at some of those efforts. All right, very good. Excellent. Plus, later on in the teaching segment, I'm going to be teaching on this. Hezekiah asked Isaiah to pray for the nation of Judah. This is very important, and we'll talk about this and much more still to come. So get your Bible guides out and get your Bible out because Corey is coming to tell us all about the things around the world. There are many remnants from the life and reign of King Hezekiah that have been found through archaeology and also just on the antiquities market. First, we are going to provide an uh, overall survey of some of the really cool things that have been found from his life. At the end of the 8th century BC, there was a king ruling Judah who saw and held off the invading Assyrian Empire. That king was Hezekiah. Famous for his tunnel that's still open in modern Jerusalem, other remnants of Hezekiah's reign have survived fire and time to bring us, dare we imagine, a glimpse of his personal style. In a collection of bullae, which are clay impressions made by personal seals, researchers have identified at least eight that belong to Hezekiah. In the ancient world, documents would be wrapped with string and sealed with wet impressed clay that would identify the document. All eight of these Hezekiah impressions read, belonging to Hezekiah, son of Ahaz, king of Judah. But Hezekiah's name is not alone. These seals also had images. Hezekiah may have been the first king of Judah to connect images with the throne. His father Ahaz's seal is known and it contains only writing. There are six of the Hezekiah bullae that have scarab beetles with wings extended upwards, and there are two that have a winged sun disk whose wings extend downward, and two Egyptian ankh signs, keys of life. In fact, all of Hezekiah's royal imagery seems to have been borrowed from Egypt, a practice of cultural seepage that is well known in other nations. Probably the original religious nature of the symbols had long since faded, with only the royal designation of power remaining. Interestingly, there have also been several thousand storage jar handles recovered from the time of Hezekiah. They bear seal impressions that read, belonging to the king, with the same Egyptian style symbols that adorned the king's seals. The scarab beetle, though this time with four wings, and the winged sun disk. As an intriguing and pivotal character in the Bible's history of Judah, King Hezekiah has turned out to be an equally intriguing, pivotal character in archaeology. You may have noticed, if you are a fan of watching the news or reading the newspaper, uh, that one of King Hezekiah's seal impressions uh, hit those major news outlets in late 2015, early 2016. Now, the reason why it made such a splash in popular media is because that particular seal was found in an officially sponsored excavation. So most of the seal impressions that, uh, that we have of Hezekiah, actually all of the seal impressions, 
different impressions that we have from King Hezekiah besides that one have been just found on the antiquities market. Now, the antiquities market is a huge business. So people who live in the area of ancient Israel in the Middle East uh, can find, you know, in their backyards, uh, when they go out uh, just on hikes, they can find artifacts and they can put those up for sale and it populates the antiquities market. Now, uh, when a seal would be uh, uh, procured by a museum or by a collector, they have archaeologists and historians and specialists verify that it's not a forgery. So uh, the other seals of Hezekiah definitely are not forgeries. They've all passed the test. But this one is just the icing on the cake, the one that has been found recently, because it was no bones about it. No one can ever dispute it. They found it in the ground uh, in an officially uh, sponsored archaeological excavation. So pretty cool news for King Hezekiah. And there are tons more artifacts uh, from his reign as well. We'll get talking about that later. King of Judah becomes a messenger between God and the King Sennacherib. When Sennacherib chooses to take on Jerusalem, he chooses to strike down the city of God without God's permission. Now King Hezekiah is not a man who ignores the living God. He loves the Lord and he desires that the people of Judah live for their Lord. This historical event is one that is unambiguous and real. God speaks through the action of his hands. King Hezekiah is out of his league in this way and over his head. He knows and he understands what must be done. So Hezekiah sends his men to the prophet. He also goes to the house of God to lay out Sennacherib's threatening letter before the Lord. Second Kings 19 verses 1 through 14. And so it was when King Hezekiah heard it that he tore his clothes, covered himself with sackcloth, and went into the house of the Lord. Then he sent Eliakim, who was over the household, Shebna the scribe, and the elders of the priests covered with sackcloth to Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos. And they said to him, Thus says Hezekiah, this day is a day of trouble and rebuke and blasphemy. For the children have come to birth, but there is no strength to bring them forth. It may be that the Lord your God will hear all the words of the Rabshakeh, whom his master, the king of Assyria, has sent to reproach the living God, and will rebuke the words which the Lord your God has heard. Therefore, lift up your prayer for the remnant that is left. So the servants of King Hezekiah came to Isaiah, and Isaiah said to them, Thus you shall say to your master, Thus says the Lord, Do not be afraid of the words which you have heard, with which the servants of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. Surely I will send a spirit upon him, and he shall hear a rumor and return to his own land, and I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. Then the Rabshakeh returned and found the king of Assyria warring against Libna, for he heard that he had departed from Lachish. And the king heard concerning Terheka, king of Ethiopia, Look, he has come out to make war with you. So he again sent messengers to Hezekiah, saying, Thus you shall speak to Hezekiah, king of Judah, saying, Do not let your God in whom you trust deceive you, saying, Jerusalem shall not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Look, you have heard what the kings of Assyria have done to all the lands by utterly destroying them, and shall you be delivered? Have the gods of the nations delivered those whom my fathers have destroyed, Gozan and Haran and Rezeph, and the people of Eden who were in Telassar? 
Where is the king of Hamath, the king of Arpad, the king of the city of Sepharvaim, Hina, and Iva? And Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. 2 Kings chapter 19, verses 1 through 14. You know, the amazing thing about studying Israel's history is all of the situations we come into. And you know, they're the same today. We just have different names for them, but it's the same if we consider it and think about it. God provided ways of escape in those days, and He will do the same today if we pray and if we pay attention to it. And that's what I'm going to talk about today with Hezekiah. But I want to remind you that you can get the Bible Guide. This is so important because the Bible Guide tells you and leads you through the Bible. And the Bible Guide is exclusive to this ministry. Write to us, or you can call us, or you can go online and download the digital copy. And we'll make sure that you get it if you make an offering in any amount. It doesn't matter the amount, but just make an offering of some kind. We'll be able to give that to you. Very, very important. Well, in our steps of faith, we need to concentrate on this today, and we need to learn about it. Details of a, of a crisis. Really? Do we want the details of a crisis? We have enough crisis in our own lives. Actually, we do, because these details are not necessarily bad good details of a crisis. Every crisis has good and bad. And every crisis, every situation tells us what to do if we listen to the Bible and to the Lord. Our reading today is 2 Kings chapter 19 to 21. And beloved, we are going to look at 2 Kings chapter 19 verses 1 to 14. And as we consider this, God is speaking to us. Let's look at what God is saying. In the scripture, it says in 2 Kings 19, verses 1 to 4, And so it was, when King Hezekiah heard it, that he tore his clothes and covered himself with sackcloth and went into the house of the Lord. And then he sent Eliakim, who was over the household, Shebna the scribe, and the elders of the priests covered with sackcloth. He sent them to Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amoz. And they said to him, Thus says Hezekiah, This day is a day of trouble and rebuke and blasphemy, for the children have come to birth, but there is no strength to bring them forth. It may be that the Lord your God will hear the words of Rabshakeh, who has his master, the king of Assyria, has sent to reproach the living God reproach the living God, look at that, and will rebuke the words which the Lord your God has heard. Therefore, lift up your prayer for the remnant that is left. This is amazing. And the, the story is this. Hezekiah asked Isaiah to pray for the people. Sennacherib's spokesman comes to Hezekiah and curse God. Can you believe that? We must be careful what we say and how we say it. And, and Hezekiah understands what's happening. Isaiah gets what's happening. What has happened is the, the Reb Shekah came and, and Sennacherib just wiped out all of the cities in Judah. And Hezekiah didn't do anything wrong. And he's just saying, Lord, why is this happening? But he gets to Jerusalem, the city of God. And he is unable to take that city. And he says to Hezekiah, you know, you're all going to die, so don't believe Hezekiah. He's all, well, Hezekiah sends to Isaiah, and this is amazing. And he says, Isaiah, pray, pray that God will work. This is really amazing. We go on in verse 5, it says, so the servants of King Hezekiah came to Isaiah, and Isaiah said to them, thus you shall say to your master, thus says the Lord, do not be afraid of the words that you have heard, with which the servants of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. Surely I will send a spirit upon him, and he shall hear a rumor, and he will return to his own land, and I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. Quote from God directly, God Almighty. Isaiah heeds the call for prayer. But he already knows the answer. 
<laughs> the king is not to fear the words spoken, beloved. We must trust God. Now, I know that when God delivers us, it's not the way we'd want. You know, we'd want God to come in with a hammer and deliver them, you know. But God does it his own way because God knows better than we do. And it's so important that we hear about this delivery system. Absolutely amazing. We go on in the scripture, then Rabshakeh returned and he found the king of Assyria warring against Libnia. For he heard that he had departed from Lachish. And the king heard concerning uh, Turkiah, the king of Ethiopia. He said, look, he has come out to make war with you. And so he again sent messengers to Hezekiah saying, thus you shall speak to Hezekiah, king of Judah saying, don't let your God in whom you trust deceive you saying, Jerusalem shall not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Look, for you have heard what the kings of Assyria have done to all the lands utterly destroying them and you shall be not, not be delivered. And have the gods of the nations delivered those whom the fathers have destroyed, Gozan and Haran and Rizpah and the people of Eden who were in Telzar? Where is the king of Hamath, the king of Arafat, or the king of the city of Shepherim? Hena and Abba and Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messengers and read it. Hezekiah went to the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. This is amazing. Hezekiah spreads the king's letter before the Lord. We must not answer for ourselves when we are attacked. We must let God work. So important. Hezekiah spreads the letter before the living Lord Jesus Christ, and he says, Lord, look it. Hezekiah just is the messenger. He's the king of Israel, but he just is, or the king of Judah, and he's just the messenger now. And God is working. God is coming against Sennacherib. Now, the history tells us Sennacherib went back, and within a few years, there was a fight, and Sennacherib was killed by his own sons. Now, that's the truth, beloved. We should listen today. King Hezekiah did not have an easy reign. There was, of course, the invasion of Sennacherib, king of Assyria. Now, that's not just recorded in the Bible. It's also recorded in the Assyrian record. So let's take a look at some of the prisms of Sennacherib and see what they say about Hezekiah. The Bible records the military campaign that King Sennacherib of Assyria carried out against Judah. Sennacherib's invasion of Judah destruction of Lachish, and the besieging of Jerusalem that traps King Hezekiah inside. The Bible is not the only document to record these events. There have been four clay cylinders and three clay prisms found buried in the foundation of Sennacherib's palace at Nineveh. He had them written less than a year after his conquest of Judah, and then buried for future generations to uncover. The prisms end with a request from Sennacherib. In future days, when this palace grows old and falls into ruins, may some future prince repair its ruined parts. May he take notice of my name. Sennacherib's effort to secure a lasting name has had pleasant side effects for us today. The rest of the text is stunning. It records, Hezekiah of Judah would not bow down to me. Forty-six of his strongholds, all walled cities, as well as innumerable smaller towns in his territory, were taken. My men brought up siege engines, raised them to the ground with battering rams, attacked and took them by storm. The king himself was holed up in his royal city, caught like a bird in a cage. The glory of my greatness overwhelmed Hezekiah in his terror. In the end, he had to submit to my yoke and pay me tribute. What Sennacherib does not say is important. Sennacherib never claims to have destroyed Jerusalem. In fact, he has his palace walls decorated with scenes of destruction from Judah's number two city, Lachish. The Bible and Sennacherib agree. The land of Judah was devastated, Hezekiah humiliated. 
but Jerusalem was not lost. At Quick Study Television, our passion is to help you learn and understand the Bible along with us. Our goal for 2016 is to expand to new television and radio stations, add more helpful materials to our website, and continue to produce innovative products to help people of all ages study the Bible. None of this would be possible without our faithful partners, both financially and prayerfully. Thank you so much. If you are currently not a partner of Quick Study, would you prayerfully consider teaming up with us so that we can continue teaching the Word of God? If you would like to become a Quick Study partner, please call our office in the U.S. at 724-733-8336 or in Canada and the rest of the world, 519-940-8338 or write to us. And remember, no gift is too small. Thank you for staying with us and being a part of reading through the Bible in one year. That's very exciting. On the next Quick Study Television program, we're going to look at the following. The sons of Adam are seven generations to Enoch and ten to Noah. Now, what does that mean? And is there some significance to that? Yes, there is. We'll talk to that and much more later on in the broadcast. First of all, here's Ryan. Ryan, what's up? Today we're focusing in on the red planet called Mars. Now, this planet has long been the obsession of mankind. You know, ancient man worshipped this planet, and you know what? Modern man continues in this practice. Let's study. Mars, the fourth planet from the sun, has long been the obsession of mankind. Indeed, ancient peoples worshipped the red planet as the god of war. While it is true that ancient man associated the color red with blood, there may have also been a more literal meaning to this. Interestingly, Mars has the largest known volcano anywhere in the solar system, called Mount Olympus. This massive volcano covers an area half the size of Texas and is twice as high as Mount Everest. Though it is now inactive, it may not have been in the past. If this is the case, then the ancient peoples would have probably been able to see this volcano erupt from the Earth. They would have literally seen the violence on Mars. Modern day man, with our all out search for extraterrestrial life, is no exception when it comes to the obsession of the red planet. This is mainly because of all the other planets in the solar system, it is the most Earth like. Although there are some similarities, Mars also has many differences. Its extreme temperatures, thin atmosphere, and lack of water makes living conditions absolutely impossible. However, the search for life on Mars continues. In 1996, NASA announced that scientists had found Mars rocks in Antarctica which contained molecules made by living things. It was discovered later, however, that the molecules were inorganic and had never been associated with life. Furthermore, these space rocks were discovered years before this claim. Interestingly, these claims happened just as Congress was debating whether or not to fund a mission to Mars. After these claims, the mission was approved. On the 4th of July in 1997, the Martian rover landed on Mars. Yet despite years of searching, no life has ever been found. Some astronomers point out that although Mars is now a dry desert, it once had past water flow. While it is unknown what happened to all the water on Mars, most astronomers believe it was evaporated into the atmosphere and eventually into space. However, water does not equal life. In fact, according to the Bible, God started with water. Genesis chapter 1 verse 2 mentions the face of the deep and that God was hovering over the face of the waters. Additionally, 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 5 says that long ago by God's word, the heavens came into being and the earth was formed out of water and by water. It is likely then that the other planets, just like earth, were also formed out of water. It is interesting that the Genesis creation account directly opposes the currently accepted Big Bang model's fiery beginning. Thanks, Ryan. An excellent, mm -hmm. excellent piece. Very good indeed. Now, what did you study today? Well, today we're taking a look at 2 Kings chapter 19, and Sennacherib is at it again. 
He is sending his threats to Hezekiah, and this time in writing, he's listing out now countries that they have conquered and the gods that they have taken captive and put into a special section of their Assyrian god temple called Captive Gods, and he's threatening once again. And I love Hezekiah. Actually, the people in the Bible are just that. They're real people like you and me. They have fears, they have strengths, weaknesses, and the Bible reveals all of that. Well, Hezekiah is full of fear. And he is ready for the Assyrians to come in and take over. But he goes to the house of God and spreads out the letter that Sennacherib has sent to him. And he declares that God is a living God. He also tells God that Sennacherib says a partial truth. And that partial truth is that, yes, uh, the Assyrians have conquered these other people and their other gods, that's only a partial truth because they're not gods. They're idols. They're made of men's hands. They're of silver and of gold. But the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is the true and living God. He's the God of the universe, the God who has created everything. And he spreads it out, and God answers him in a powerful, powerful way. And it was just a great reminder for not only me, but for you as well. You know what? I've written it here. In the face of the enemy with his taunts and even sometimes partial truths, we must declare our trust in the only living God because that is our testimony and our witness in this world where it seems like there's no hope, but there is. There are times when we can fight off attacks by ourselves, but when the attacks get deep and personal, they are spiritual. We can do nothing about them, and Hezekiah knows this. He is a great king and an interesting man of God. He does not respond to the warning Sennacherib gives. He places the king's letter before God to ensure that God sees it. Now, God is omnipresent and already knows the contents of the letter and the final outcome. But Hezekiah needs to know that God is working. The Lord creates problems in Assyria that eventually defeat the enemy. We must never take God for granted. Jesus Christ came 2,000 years ago, come from God, and he lived a perfect life and died on the cross and rose again to take the ravages of sin off of us. And today, we live this time now and we say, Lord Jesus, why did you do that? And he says, because I wanted to provide a way to heaven for each of you. Invite Jesus to be Lord of your life and he will come and take the ravages of sin away from you and give you eternal life.